I'm Alan Dodds Frank, the president of the Solorians, for those of you who do not know me. And I have a little business to attend to. Claiborne, I forgot to ask you this before. These are some glasses that were left at a couple of lunches ago. And I, I, I think it was at your table, but I guess if you're, I don't know. Anyway, did anybody lose some glasses that look like this? Okay, check with me afterward. I, the answer is, I don't know. I can't see them. I don't have my glasses. Anyway, welcome. Um, well, I have... Uh, does anybody hear that fan? Is that as loud as can be? Uh, Raymond, can you turn off the fan, please? I'm talking to the, the, the longtime players employee who always helps us with the sound here. I, I think it's because we have the heat on. But we're not in Buffalo anymore. Um, I, I hope uh, you all noticed that uh, one of our previous speakers, Ben Smith, managed to write a little article, and the New York Times managed to write about it, outing the Uber senior executive who thinks it would be a great idea to just tail uh, reporters and retaliate with details about their personal life. I must say, when I saw that story, all I could think of is, I wonder how many insider traders have already bribed Uber employees to get uh, the records for Uber cars or guys doing unannounced M&A deals. Uh, and so I know Bob Fisk did not take an Uber car here today uh, because he is, in my opinion, and, and I'm thrilled that he's here, one of the lawyers about whom you can say he has absolutely impeachable, unimpeachable. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys decide. No. He is, he is a man of the highest integrity. Let's put it that way. I've got that impeachable, unimpeachable thing out of my head here. I mean, it has nothing to do with the whitewater. Um, but let me get through a little business. First, I hope you all uh, come for the dinner on December the 10th, uh, honoring Sandy Sokolow, the uh, esteemed CBS producer of World News, I mean, not World News Tonight, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and many other accomplishments. I mean, he was so well known when I was a, a correspondent in a competing network that in Washington there is a piece of real estate known as Sokolow Square because it's where he would send the correspondents out of the CBS bureau to do a last minute stand up. And it was a triangle about the size of this table, and you would be lucky to not get hit by a cab leaping the curb when you were doing a stand-up. But anyway, uh, so we're he is in Malaysia today, otherwise he'd be here. Uh, and um, so we're going to have him as our honoree on December 10th, so please come. And then we'll have a lunch in mid-January, and you'll hear more about that later. So my uh, first, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to have a, a moment of silence for two of our members who have died since our last meeting. One, Isabel Mount, 86. She was the widow of Murray Schumach, and she also worked at the many museums promoting their cultural missions from MoMA to the Museum of Natural History. And Sam Surratt, who was the CBS News Archivist for 25 years, his wife, his widow now, I guess, Judy Hull, is also a Silurian. She, too, was a f a formerly at CBS. Thank you. Now, I'd like to welcome a couple of our new members. We have four new members, and I'm happy to report, thanks to the absolute uh, diligence of longtime membership chairman and former Solarians president, Mort Scheinman, we and the recruiting efforts of former President Mike Kandel and many other Silurians, we have now reached the 300 mark. We have 301 members. And I mean members who have actually paid their dues. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, several of the new members who I see are here. Let's start with Martha Weinman Lear, author, freelance, magazine writer, Writer and editor of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. 
Welcome, Martha. <laughs> Marvin Siegel, a, a freelance editor who was also at the New York Times, is a, 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 now a, a new member, and I think Marvin is not here, but Howard Epstein, I think, is here. Howard, are you here? Thanks very much. Welcome. Uh, he's a former editor and publisher of Facts on File. And uh, he's a freelance writer and publishing consultant. I, I remember I used to use Facts on File all the time. Another new member who may still come in, but uh, was unsurprisingly at Bloomberg News, they decided to keep him chained to his desk. Uh, but Mike Serrell, who's the assistant managing editor of Bloomberg Markets Magazine and a former president of the Overseas Press Club, uh, is also a new member. Uh, I see Dan Basies is a new member, relatively new member is here. Dan, I can't remember what I introduced you before. I think I did and you weren't here. But since you're here, are there any other new members I uh, failed to introduce or who were not here when they became new members? If so, please stand up and wave. Anyway, now it is my pleasure to introduce, oh, wait a minute, I forgot his book. No, I didn't. Robert B. Fist, Jr., who I think is one of the great lawyers of the country, I have. Uh, I, I was trying to figure out when I, we first met. It may have been when he was a U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, a.k.a. Manhattan, um, in the 70s when I was covering the Justice Department for the Washington Star, or it may have been while he was defending various people. It may well have been when I was at Forbes and he was representing the National Football League against the USFL and a uh, self-promoting entrepreneur named Donald Trump. Uh, or it may have been later when I know at ABC News I was chasing him around Little Rock, Arkansas in the dead of the winter there, such as it is, uh, when he was the first Whitewater special counsel. Uh, I wish I could tell you that he was leaking stuff to me night and day, but it would be a lie. <laughs> he didn't tell me a damn thing, and I was lucky to get a full shot of his face. Because um, <laughs> he was pretty fleet of foot and kept his staff um, at a considerable distance from the news media. Uh, Bob also, and I know at least Ralph Blumenthal and I were in the courtroom when he was defending Alfred Taubman. Uh, in the Sotheby's price fix, Sotheby's Christie's price fixing trial, uh, a, a white collar defendant who I actually view in a sort of a different, with a different lens than the way I look at, say, Bernie Ebers of WorldCom. Um, and so I'm sure Bob is going to tell us about all these characters and many more who have, have passed through his life, who he has done his best to either prosecute or defend. And, and what's so interesting is. Throughout all this, he has had many interactions with the press. Uh, I haven't uh, put any thumb screws on him, so I'm not sure whether he'll tell us about any of the egregious behavior or whatever uh, many of us have committed while in pursuit of him, or inaccuracies, or how we got it right and helped the case. I don't know. It's up to him. I mean, he's just going to let it rip. And then, of course, as usual, we will have questions. Bob? Oh. Here's his new book, by the way, which we have for sale. It's a terrific book, Prosecutor, Defender, and Counselor, and thanks to his publisher, we have it available afterward. I'm pretty sure Bob can be convinced to sign one for you for 21 bucks. It's all here. Please welcome Robert Fisk. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Alan asked me to talk for maybe uh, 30 minutes or so and allow another 30 minutes for questions. And so what I thought I'd do is sort of go through what's basically in my book, sort of quickly let you know what's in there, and then leave it to you to ask me questions about which of those things interest you the most. But basically, the theme of the book and the reason I wrote it, it was supposed to, it's designed to be an example, hopefully an inspiration to young lawyers about how you can have a very successful career combining private practice with periods of public service. <clears throat> and I spent 46 years at the same law firm, Davis Polk and Wardwell, <clears throat> and nine years in public service 
with three different stints in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, as a summer intern and when I was in law school, as an assistant U.S. attorney for four years, and then for four years as, as the U.S. attorney. And then, as Alan indicated, I had a period of seven months uh, in Arkansas and Washington as the first Whitewater Independent Counsel. <clears throat> I decided to go to law school when I was in my senior year at Yale. And my dad had been a, a big deal at the Yale Law School. He'd been editor-in-chief of the Law Journal. So he, he recommended that I go see the dean of the Yale Law School, Wesley Sturgis, to get some advice. And I, I told my dad I really didn't want to go to the Yale Law School. I'd been a Yale undergraduate for four years. I didn't want seven years in New Haven, but I would appreciate the advice from Judge Dean Sturgis. So I went to see him, and I started out by saying, no offense, Dean Sturgis, but I've spent four years in New Haven. I don't think I'm going to apply to the Yale Law School. And he came right back and he said, well, I've looked at your transcript, and that's probably a wise decision. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. And then I said, well, what would you recommend? And he said, well, I think either Harvard or Michigan. And I'd grown up in Connecticut. I lived in the East my whole life. Half my class was going to Harvard Law School. I thought I'm going to do something different. So I went out to Michigan Law School, and it turned out to be one of the best things I've ever did. I had a wonderful education out there. I did well. And I've been very loyal to the university and the law school. And one of the things that I'm proud of is that in recent years, in gratitude for the education I got there and, and because of my commitment to government service, I created fellowships, endowed fellowships, uh, which allow four graduating students every year to, who go into government service to have all their college and law school loans repaid for three years, which basically allows young lawyers who want to go into government service, who have that kind of debt, to get their loans repaid so they don't have to go into private practice to do it. So that was a nice way to sort of pay Michigan back for what they did for me. <laughs> so I came to Davis Polk, and I, that's the law firm I started with in 1955. 1957, I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office as an assistant U.S. Attorney, and Alan asked me about my, my dealings with the press. Well, I'll tell you about my very first dealings with the press. I'd been there about two weeks, and they arrested somebody for, a, for an attempted bank robbery. And this was a, a kind of a scruffy guy that came in, long hair, and he had a wooden gun. He had made a gun out of wood. And he pointed it at the teller and handed the teller a note and said, this is a stick-up, S-T-I-K-U-P. <laughs> well, I caught the whole thing on camera, of course. He was arrested as he went out the door. And so I arraigned him in front of the magistrate, and the press was there, and they set bail. The next morning, I read in, in a newspaper that is no longer in existence, said the um, Defendant was held in $5,000 bail as Assistant U.S. Attorney Robert Fisk told the magistrate he hatched a plot to rob a bank but laid an egg in the process. <laughs> so I called the reporter up. I said, well, where'd that come from? He said, he said well, that's a lot better than what you said. <laughs> Fortunately, my dealings with the press have been more positive since then. But one of the cases I prosecuted, and some of you will remember this, what, and this is amazing why that U.S. Attorney's Office is such a fantastic experience for a young lawyer. I was 28 years old, and I prosecuted a, a racketeer named John Diagardi, better known as Johnny Dio, who had been responsible for the acid blinding of a Daily Mirror reporter named Victor Rizel. And the U.S. Attorney's Office was investigating labor racketeering Victor Rizal was writing articles about it and was actually providing valuable information to the office. One night he walked out of a Lindy's restaurant up on the Upper West Side and a man came out of the shadows, threw acid in his face and blinded him. They were indicted for the acid blinding and they had two witnesses that had been convicted that were going to cooperate. The last minute they refused to cooperate and the judge ordered them to testify and they refused claiming a Fifth Amendment right which they couldn't do since they'd already been convicted. And it was Judge Hurland's, and this is headlines in the Daily News and the Daily Mirror at the time. He said, this isn't the case of underworld. Uh, this isn't the case of constitutional silence. This is a case of underworld lockjaw. <clears throat> and 
But we had a tax evasion case, which I prosecuted, and I convicted him, and he went to jail. This is at 28 years old. Um, I went back to Davis Polk, and I was there for 15 years, and I worked with Hazard Gillespie and Lawrence Walsh on a series of cases, probably the, the, the electrical equipment price-fixing cases, the, the def successful defense of Thomas Lamont, director of J.P. Morgan in the first insider trading case that was involved in, brought involving Texas Gulf Sulphur, helping defend the, manu the, the license, American licensee of thalidomide against product liability cases. And then I had two, what I thought at the time were fairly inconsequential cases in front of a federal judge named Harold Tyler, involved somebody that had hired somebody else as salesman and they tried to enjoin him from, because, he, because of trade secrets and I, I won both of those. And that, led, that gets you to 1975. And in 1975, if you'll remember, after Watergate, the Department of Justice was in total disarray. There had been a series of attorney generals. John Mitchell had gone to jail. Declined Eats had been convicted. Uh, Saxby had resigned to, the senator from Ohio to become ambassador to India. And Gerald Ford made a brilliant move and brought in a man named Edward Levy to head the Justice Department. He was the president of Chicago, had been the dean of the Chicago Law School, brought instant credibility to the Justice Department. But he didn't know a thing about law enforcement. He'd never been in private practice. He'd never been in government service. So he did an equally smart thing, and he asked Judge Tyler, who had been a former assistant U.S. attorney, first head of the Civil Rights Division in the Eisenhower administration, to come down to Washington and be the deputy attorney general. And Judge Tyler asked me to come in to be the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. And this is, and mind you, I, I live in, I'm a resident of Connecticut. And, but, but I, he asked me would I be interested in this job, and I said, it's the best job in the world for me. Absolutely, I'd be interested. And so, for about a week, I'm getting calls from all my friends that the FBI's been around, they've been asking questions about you. All of a sudden, that stopped. So I called up Paul Curran, the U.S. Attorney who had just resigned, and who would, we'd been assistant U.S. attorneys together, and I said, you know, find out what's going on. So he called me back that afternoon. He said, this, this is not good. He said, the U.S., the senior senator from New York, Jacob Javits, found out about this, and he told Tyler, you don't pick U.S. attorneys. I do. Stopped the FBI check and had his own candidate, who was a very, very highly qualified person. So this went down to the wire, and I'm thinking, and what part is politics going to play in this appointment? I never contributed to Senator Javits. I never contributed to Buckley, who was the other senator. I hadn't been active in politics at all. I was a registered Republican, but I had voted for them because I lived in Connecticut. And, but in the end, and it's a tri tribute to Judge Tyler, I'll never know exactly what went on between him and Senator Javits. He obviously gave Senator Javits something that Javits wanted. Because in the middle of December, I'm at a meeting out in Ohio, and somebody comes in and says, you better have an important phone call to make. I call my secretary and says, you have to call Senator Javits. I called him, and he said, Bob, I've decided you're going to be the U.S. attorney. <laughs> now, you step back. I, I can't imagine something like that happening today. I mean, this was a purely 100 percent, in Tyler's view, appointment on the professional merits, but it got better because I was appointed in March of 76. Everybody said, you know, what do you, why do you want to take this job? You know, Gerald Ford has just pardoned Richard Nixon. There's no way he's going to beat this rising young star from Georgia that's running for the Democrats. You know what's going to happen. In November, he's, Carter's going to win. You're going to be out. You'll only be there six, four, three or four months. Why do you want to do this? I said, this is the best job. If I could have this job for a week, I would take it. So some of you will remember what happened in the fall of 76. Carter indeed beat um, uh, Ford. But at the same time, the, 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 the new senator from New York was Dan Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had defeated Bella Abzug and Ramsey Clark in a three-way primary, and then defeated James Buckley in the election. And Moynihan said, you know, I know a lot about economics. I know a lot about... Uh, labor, I know a lot about foreign policy. I don't know anything about judges. I don't know anything about U.S. attorneys. The one thing I do know is I'm not sure it makes sense to just automatically throw out the, the U.S. attorneys every time there's a change in administration. 
So he appointed a committee of lawyers, said, look at the jobs they're doing, tell me if they're doing a good job, and I'll keep them on. So to make a long story short, they decided I was doing a good job, as was David Traeger in the Eastern District and Dick Arcara in Buffalo. So we all got to finish our nominal four-year terms, four-year terms at the pleasure of the president. But uh, Moynihan persuaded Carter to, to make this appointment. And, and it, it was an amazing thing on Moynihan's part because there were two co-chairmen of Carter's campaign for president in New York. And this was one of those elections where there were maybe four or five states where the people that ran the campaign said, could say, if you hadn't won our state, you would have lost. And New York was one of those. And so what do these two people want? The reports were that one of them wanted to be the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, and the other wanted his best friend to be the U.S. attorney in Buffalo. Notwithstanding that, Moynihan, with the strong backing of Griffin Bell, who was then the U.S. attorney, persuaded Carter to allow me to finish my four-year term. And when I went into that job, one of the things that, that was important to me, I'd, I'd learned under Judge J. Edward Lombard in the summer of 1954, and he felt it, it's different today, it's much harder today for U.S. attorneys to go into court and try cases, and it happens less today th than it did then. It's much harder for them to do that. But back then, I felt that was an important part of leadership. And so I said, I want to try a case when the right one comes along. Well, the right one comes along, and here's my second reference to the press. And it came along thanks to the New York Times. Because um, in this February of 1977, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, had finished a long investigation of the of the man who was re leading the biggest drug ring in New York. He was a man named Leroy, called him Nicky Barnes. And it was the most insidious drug ring in the country. It was worse than that because he'd been indicted four times by the Bronx and Manhattan DAs and acquitted four times. And he had the reputation of being, quote, Mr. Untouchable. And so we indicted him in, this, in February, the trial set for September, two experienced narcotics division Lawyers were going to try it. June 5th, 1977, on the cover of the New York Times Magazine section, is a picture of Nicky Barnes in a very arrogant post like this with a caption, Mr. Untouchable. And the art it's a long article <clears throat> which describes the, the lifestyle he leads in Harlem, how much, how much money his drug ring makes, millions of dollars a week, <clears throat> and how he leads this flamboyant lifestyle. He's a hero in Harlem because he makes the fun of the cops. He leads them on wild goose chases. And there's a scene where, in the middle of one of his trials, in the state court, he goes into the washroom. There's a detective standing next to him. They're both washing their hands. The detective uses a paper towel. Nicky Barnes reaches into his pocket, pulls out a roll of $100 bills, dries his hands, and throws them in. <laughs> but the worst was that he had become a role model in, in Harlem and the South Bronx for young African-American kids. White guys go to Wall Street. We can make money selling drugs. And look at Nikki. We can get away with it. <clears throat> so the article ends by saying, <clears throat> now the feds are taking their shot, but the betting in Harlem is it's going to come out the same way. <clears throat> so the next morning at 9 o'clock, I'm in the office. I get a call from Griffin Bell. He said, I've just come from a cabinet meeting. President Carter has read this article. And he told the cabinet, this is the most important case in the United States, because if we can't put somebody like this away, there's something wrong with our administration of justice. And <clears throat> he turned to, to Bell and he said, so I hope we have a good case. Judge Bell didn't know anything about it. He said, don't worry, Mr. President, we got a very strong case. And he says to me, Bob, we do, don't we? And I said, well, you know, it's, it, we're, we've got it, problems, informants, and wh whatever, but I think we'll be okay. There's a pause, and he said, well, I hope we send in the first team. So I got, I got the point. I took over the case, tried it before the first anonymous sequestered jury. Ten-month trial, we convicted him, got life without parole. And then I also tried another case that you probably all remember, prosecuted Anthony Scotto, the head of the ILA, for taking bribes on the, on the waterfront. 
But that was a that was a fantastic four years, and one of the best parts about it for me was having the chance to work with young lawyers and, and give them the same kind of training, both in the professional skills and in the and in, in the in the values that go with the prosecutor's office that I had learned from my predecessors. So I went back to Davis Polk, and I was there for uh, <coughs> for another. Um, I went back, and the first thing I had was. I defended the manufacturer of the reactor at Three Mile Island in his $4 billion suit by the utility. We tried that case for three months and, the, and it was settled on terms which basically were a capitulation by the other side. So that was a big victory. My next case was Alan alluded to, I represented the NFL in the suit by the USFL. And if you may remember that, I'll just dwell on that for a second. The USFL was a great concept. It, Somebody got the idea, let's play football in the spring. There's not much going on in February and March. We'll get like AAA baseball players, that quality football players, and play in the spring. And they did pretty well. They did well the first two years. And, and then Donald Trump took over the team called the New Jersey Generals. And he decided that what the league should do was move to the fall, go head to head with the NFL the same way the old AFL had done with the old NFL and had made life so uncomfortable that the NFL had merged with the AFL. And I think Donald Trump thought that's what they would happen here. They could bid up the salaries to the point where they would make it too uncomfortable for the NFL and so they just, they would merge with the USFL and Donald Trump would get to be an NFL owner. Well, it didn't work out that way. The case went to trial and, <clears throat> uh, and it became pretty clear that what happened was that in trying to bid up the salaries, the, the NFL owners, that they didn't like it, the salaries went up a lot, and Donald Trump and Alfred Taubman, who owned the Detroit team, could, could pay the salaries, but people like the owner of the San Antonio Gunslingers couldn't, and so a lot of the USFL teams basically went bankrupt and the league folded. So then they sue the NFL, saying you monopolized television, and you, that's the reason we went out of business. And so we're in the courtroom at the end of the, and we, we said basically you went out of business because you shot yourself in the foot. So <clears throat> we're, in the, we're in the courtroom and the, and the USFL lawyers are at the front table, we're at the next table. And the verdict comes in a, in a series of interrogatories. With a, so the jury's answering one question at a time. CBS radio is there broadcasting the, the verdict as it comes in. The first question is, did the NFL monopolize, is the NFL a monopoly? Yes. The next question is, did they monopolize pro football? Yes. Did they monopolize television? Yes. Then they go down to all 27 clubs. Yes is to each one. The next one is, did this cause injury to the USFL? Yes. Meanwhile, the two things are going on. The people at the lawyers for the USFL are bouncing around at their table like, you know, they're, they, they had claimed and they had a damage expert said that the damages were $3 billion. So they, they had big dollar signs in their eyes. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, I mean, uh, Pete Rozelle is coming down. He hears there's a verdict. He says, he says, driver, take me to the courthouse. He goes down and he hears all these verdicts. He, he's about at 23rd Street when he hears damage to the USFL. He says to a driver, turn around. Driver turns around, and then the next question is, how much damages? The answer, one dollar. Two things, that the, the table in front of us collapses like air out of a balloon. Pete Rozell says to the driver, turn around again, goes down to the courthouse, and to cop it all up in the courtroom, sitting side by side are Donald Trump and current owner of the Giants, John Mara, then the son of Wellington Mara. And when the verdict comes in for a dollar, well, uh, John Mayer reaches into his wallet and pulls out a dollar bill and hands it to Donald Trump. <laughs> so that's my Donald Trump story. Huh? So then I represented New Zealand in the litigation over the America's Cup. Does it violate the deed of gift of America's Cup, which talks about friendly competition between countries to race a catamaran against a monohull? I represented New Zealand that was claiming that that was unfair. Um, we had two sailors on the court. For any sailor, that's an easy question. The answer, easy answer is obviously that is unfair. For five non-sailors on the Court of Appeals who thought 
this case didn't belong there in the first place because it's just a bunch of sore losers. They should settle this on their own terms. Uh, that was an easy answer to no. And as Judge Walker said in his opinion, I never thought the finish line of the America's Cup would be on Eagle Street. So then I had, after that, I had, when I, <laughs> in later times, I had the defense of Albert Taubman in the Sotheby's case. And then most recently, I had the pleasure of representing Fred Wilpon in the Madoff litigation and hopefully in bringing him out of that with a very, very successful settlement. So that, that's what I had been doing in private practice. And that's the kind of illustration I, what I say to young lawyers, when you're in public service and you get a reputation from what you've done, those are the kind of cases that come to you. And they, when the American lawyer wrote an article after the Three Mile Island case, and they asked the general counsel of, of, of Babcock and Wilcox, well, why did you pick Bob Fisk? And he said, well, he seemed to have a pretty good record as US attorney. So that's a good example of, how, of why the two go so well together. But then what I would like to talk about for just a minute or two, because this is right sure why Alan brought me here, <clears throat> was to talk about uh, my experience with Whitewater. Um, and <clears throat> when I was uh, uh, in the US Attorney's Office, the US Attorney, the, the Deputy Attorney General working for Janet Reno was a law professor from Harvard named Philip Hyman. And the head of the, and Philip Hyman had been, uh, Philip Hyman was the head of the criminal division when I was the US, Attorney's, uh, U.S. Attorney. He became the Deputy Attorney General under Janet Reno. And the person that became head of the criminal division under Janet Reno was a, a wonderful woman who just died last week named Joanne Harris, who had been an assistant U.S. Attorney with me in the Southern District. And so when the allegations started swirling around about the Clintons in Whitewater, and particularly allegations by a municipal judge named David Hale, who ran a small business called Capital Management, who had gone, who had been indicted for defrauding the Small Business Administration, tried to make a deal with the U.S. Attorney and and didn't, and then went public with the allegation that that Governor Clinton had come to him at one point, and it said that that he should that he should get uh, Susan McDougal and Jim McDougal. Clinton's partners in the Whitewater development to make an application to the Small Business Administration, have capital management, David Hale's company would make an application for a loan saying it was for the business of, of Susan McDougall's advertising company, but really the money would be used to help the Clintons pay off their Whitewater debt. If that was true, that's a federal crime. That's lying to the small a federal agency. So, that, together with the fact that Vince, Vincent Foster, the deputy White House counsel, was found dead in Fort Marcy Park because of an apparent suicide, led to the call for an appointment of an independent counsel. And for a long time, Janet Reno said, uh, what had happened, just, just a quick history. Um, you remember Watergate, there was no, there, when Elliot Richardson felt that the Justice Department couldn't invent, investigate Nixon, he appointed, under the Code of Federal Regulations, Archibald Cox, a Harvard law professor. But Cox was going full steam ahead, came out, there were White House tapes, he subpoenaed them, Nixon went nuts, said He's, this guy's out of control, told Richardson, you gotta fire Cox. Nick, Richardson said, no. Nixon said, you're fired. Next in line was a man named Ruckelshaus, Deputy Attorney General, same thing, fire Cox, no, you're fired. The next one in line was a solicitor general, a man named Robert Bork. Richardson and Ruckelshaus went to Bork and they said, look, we've made the point here and you've got to carry out the order. You've got to fire Cox because if you don't, he's just going to go right down the line in the Justice Department and we'll end up finally with somebody that will do it nowhere near as well qualified as you are. So Bork fired him, appointed Leon Jaworski, and as I say, the rest is history. <coughs> Jaworski convicted him. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, Dean, he did a fantastic job. But in the wake of that, Congress said, we can't let this happen again. We're gonna create a three-judge court appointed by the Chief Judge, Judge Justice, and when there are credible allegations against a high-ranking government official, you can apply to the three-judge court, and the three-judge court will appoint someone who can't be fired without the approval of the court, make the job bulletproof. There was a sunset provision, it had to be re renewed every five years. And it was, it worked very well for quite a while 
Then my partner, Lawrence Walsh, became the independent counsel in Iran-Contra. The Republicans became very unhappy with him, so they refused to renew the statute. So the statute had lapsed when all these allegations came up about Whitewater. So when the Republicans and even the Democrats said to, to um, Janet Reno, we want you to appoint an independent counsel like uh, Richardson did, she said, well, I don't want to do that because somebody will say, how, how can a person that I appoint, I, I report to the president, so how could a person, if I appoint someone, there will be at least an appearance of a lack of independence. But uh, finally, the pressure was so great that Clinton himself asked her, asked her to make an appointment. And so and I, that came out publicly on Wednesday, on a Wednesday. And I, I, I remember thinking, you know, Bill Hyman's the deputy attorney general, Joanne Harris is the, is the head of the criminal division. I'm sure, at the very least, I'm going to be one of the names on the list. So it gave me a, a day or two to think about this. And what would I do if they call? And on the one hand, I knew this is, this is a, a, these are really tough jobs. I mean, you get, a, you get attacked on either side, one, one side or the other that doesn't like what you're doing, you get attacked. And it, it would mean going down to Arkansas for three or four years, being away from home, leaving my firm. But then I said, you know, how could I possibly say no if I'm asked? The President of the United States is under a cloud. Somebody's got to do it. If I'm asked to do it, I'm going to do it. So the next two days later, 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm in my office. My daughter, Susan, from Whalen, Mass, calls up, and she said, Dad, my cousin Addie, who's in the next neighboring town, was riding to work. She's listening to NPR, Nina Totenberg, well known for her sources within the Justice Department, says it's between you and Dan Webb, a very highly qualified former U.S. attorney from Chicago. So that night, Joanne called and said, can you do it? I said, how could I possibly say no? And so I did. I said yes. And so then I, I was appointed under the Code of Federal Regulations. And then what happens is, you have first thing you have to do is, what is your jurisdiction? Because under the Code of Federal Regulations, what, whatever jurisdiction she gave me in this order, that, that the Justice Department would no longer have any say about that. I would be, for all practical purposes, the Attorney General for that area. And so I came down there, and, she, and Joanne said, well, we've drafted something up here, but you take a yellow pad, go in the other room, and write out whatever you want, and we think within reason you, you, you'll get it. And so I did, and, and uh, I did get it. And so I was um, uh, announced the next day. And then I, I remember walking out of that press conference, and I'm thinking, you know, yesterday I'm in my 29th floor at 450 Lexington Avenue working on a case for this client or that client with people all around to help me. Now all of a sudden, here I am, I'm all alone. I, I have no office, I have no staff. I'm an attorney general for the United, for the, of the United States for one of the most high-profile investigations you can imagine. So what do I do? So finding an office was easy enough, but I immediately went out and put a staff together of people that I knew and trusted, people that worked for me at Davis Polk that had been in the U.S. Attorney's Office, a wonderful man named Rod Lankler who had been deputy head of the Homicide Bureau under Bob Morgenthau, deal with the foster issue, and then through people like Bob Mueller, Griffin Bell, other people I knew around the country, I brought in other people. But the most important thing to me, I, I had 300 written resumes come in. I just never looked at them, or I skimmed through them and put them aside, because I wanted people that I, I had the intangible qualities that were going to be so important. The loyalty, the the team effort, you know, the judgment. They weren't going to weren't going to leak to the press, <clears throat> and you know, <clears throat> and and so I I put together a very solid team. And we went down to Washington, down to Little Rock, and just one kind of amusing story. The, the, person, the first person I hired was a woman named Julie O'Sullivan, who had been at Davis Polk, been an assistant U.S. attorney, is now a distinguished professor at Georgetown. And she, she and I went down the first day, and we didn't have an office yet. We were staying at a place called the Amerisuites. Alan probably remembers it. It was on a hill, and we were going to meet with the FBI agents the next morning. They were at one financial center was down the hill, about 100 yards, fairly steep hill. Well, Alan mentioned the Arkansas winters. Well, we had, there was an ice storm that night. And as ice storms like we don't get here, this was brutal. 
We got up in the morning, looked out the window, cars were sliding across the parking lot. One person walked out the door, took two steps, fell flat on his back. We said, there's no way we're gonna drive down there. There's no way we can walk down there. How are we gonna get there? And I don't remember whether it was Julie's idea or mine, but we ended up sitting on our raincoats, sliding down the hill. <laughs> so there are the FBI agents waiting to see the new, US, new independent council. Oh, here he comes. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, uh, we were there for about nine months. We issued two reports. One, one we found that Vince Foster had committed suicide. He had not been murdered and, and transported to Fort Marcy Park, uh, which the, the conspiracy theory was that he knew too much. The Clintons had him rubbed out somewhere else. They moved him to Fort Marcy Park, propped him up to make it look like a suicide. We concluded it was indeed a suicide. And we also found that there was no obstruction of justice in what had come out involving some contacts between the Treasury Department and the White House involving investigations by the RTC. So we issued those two reports. And then at the same time, the independent counsel statute was renewed. And so Janet Reno applied to the three-judge court, said, I want an independent counsel. I think it should be Mr. Fisk. He's, you know, he's well, into, well into it. And at first I thought this is a no-brainer. But that was in, in June. All July went by, nothing happened. I began to get concerned, and on August 5th, uh, my, my wife was down in Florida visiting her 93-year-old mother who was in the hospital. She'd been there for a few days, and I said, I'll come down and spend the weekend with you. So I flew down to, uh, little, to, uh, Washington, to uh, Orlando, and as I'm walking off the, uh, the plane, my beeper goes off and it says, call your Washington office. So I call the Washington office, and Mark Stein, one of the people I had hired, said, Bob, you're not going to believe this. You've been replaced by Ken Starr. So that's how that happened. And so what happened after that, and this is, this is in the book, the first of two things. The lawyers I were working with were furious. They all wanted to quit. And I said to them, you can't do that. You know, this is really important. We've got a lot of momentum here. We're, we were about ready to bring eight indictments against 11 people. You know, this is important work. We got to stay on. You have to stay on long enough for Ken Starr to pick his people you run with a baton and so you can work together until they're ready to do it and then you can leave, but you can't walk out now. <clears throat> and then they said, they said, well, you gotta talk to the agents. Because they literally, they, they were FBI agents that were crying because they thought, you know, we have done all this, we're all ready to do this, and all of a sudden the plug has been pulled out from under us. So I scheduled a meeting uh, the following Tuesday. All the FBI agents, all the IRS agents, all the lawyers that are working with me. And I said, we were about, to return in the fall of 94, spring of 95, eight indictments involving 11 people, including Webster Hubble for defrauding his clients and his partners, Jim Guy Tucker, the governor of Arkansas, for two different frauds, a bankruptcy tax fraud and a fraud involving uh, capital management, and eight other indictments. And I said, Ken Starr is coming in here. Ken Starr is a man of integrity. He's gonna do the right thing with this evidence we've developed. It's gonna take him a lot longer because he has no experience as a prosecutor and he has to bring in a new team, but these indictments will happen. And they did happen. They all, every single one of those indictments was brought and they resulted in a conviction. <clears throat> so it was just, I found it very frustrating. I said to somebody, you know, is this like, a, I used to play football, at least in high school. I was too small in college. <clears throat> but. It's like, a, imagine a, a rainy day, and the, you're the halfback, and you carry the ball five yards here, four yards here, three yards here. Finally, you get the ball down to the two-yard line. The whistle blows. Out comes this guy in a nice, clean uniform. You're out of the game. He takes the ball into the end zone. I said, I felt a little bit like that. Now, there was more to it than that, and Ken Starr had, wasn't that, that simple, but, but he did follow through, and he did bring those indictments. Um, I just want to say one thing about Vince Foster and then I'll answer any questions. Um, after we, f we made, found our report that it was a suicide, Ken Starr investigated again. Three years later, he came out with a report saying the same thing. And both of us were attacked, he as well as I, by people that still refused to believe that this wasn't a murder 
and, and the body transported to Fort Marcy Park. And to me, the, the, the one simple answer to that, and it's in the book, we're getting near the end of, of this part of the investigation. And Rod Lankler had appointed a really outstanding panel of, of forensic experts, chief medical examiner from New York, Charles Hirsch, Seattle, the armed forces, and somebody from the FBI. <clears throat> when they found Foster, he was on an incline, lying down with a gun in his mouth. He'd been sitting up, and it was clear what happened. He shot himself in the mouth and then fallen backwards. He was wearing a clean white shirt, and the pictures taken of him lying there, his shirt is absolutely spotless. And what had happened, um, I, I remember saying to, to Dr. Hirsch, well, when he concluded that this was a suicide in Fort Marcy Park, I said, are you sure? And he said, I am 100% sure. Any other conclusion is impossible. And I said, wait a minute. You know, I, I've been doing this a long time. I've had lots of expert witnesses. And it's always on the one hand this, on the one hand the other, but on balance, blah, 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 blah. I've never heard anybody say 100% anything else is impossible. And he laughed and he said, well, this is. And he, his explanation was very simple. As soon as he died, his heart stopped pumping. All the blood ran down into his legs. As soon as they found him and they put him on a stretcher to, to, or a gurney to take to the morgue and he leveled out, the blood rushed back, leveled out, and his white shirt was totally bloodstained. And Hirsch's point was if anybody had killed him somewhere else and brought him to Fort Marcy Park, that's the way his shirt would have looked. And he later testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which reached the same conclusion, he said the same thing. It, it, his direct quote was, is my unequivocal, categorical opinion that it was impossible for him to have been murdered and brought to Fort, Fort Marcy Park. And to all of you, I hope that sounds right, but it never quieted everybody down. Anyway, that, that's a quick, hope it's not more than 30 minutes. If it was, I'm sorry. No, sir.